All right. Water bottle. Water bottle. Water bottle. Water bottle. Nice. I was gonna give you a water bottle. I was gonna do the fancy speaker thing. Like, oh, oh, get up there. Oh, water. Oh, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone want one? I can. Water bottles, anyone? Self service. Otherwise. Right. This is the one I'm drinking. Do you mind if we share? Oh, uh, no, no, it's fine. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so if you want to get on the guest Wi-Fi, I think I heard that question, you can go on a CN guest, type any email address you want, mm -hmm. and click on the accept button. Do not hit enter, do not hit tab enter, do not try to do anything that might allow accessible things to work. <laughs> click with your mouse. <laughs> what they're for. <laughs> I think everyone's not. It's weird if I stand up there and try to start to announce these things with like five bottles of water. <laughs> so, hello. Happy New Year. Thank you all so much for coming. It's been a hell of a long time. What? Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. My birthday was today. My birthday was two days ago. We missed it. We did. We did. Sing. There, sing. You said anything about sing. What's up? I have a meetup on Saturday. I can pull it off if I really want. Sunday, actually. Uh, but this is actually the best birthday present ever. Well, I, at the time, I actually had a gigantic karaoke party that was a lot of fun. So if anyone would like to get me to one and have me sing for four hours, you are welcome to. Um, but this is the new year. Next meetup. Uh, or, but this is the next meetup. So we finally have it. So December, we didn't have one. Uh, I think a lot of you came to the holiday party and haven't been to a meetup before, so I'm really happy to see you here today. Uh, the holiday party was fun. We went to some bar over there, New York Beer Company. New York Beer Company. We had a lot of people, a lot of food, a lot of talk about not JavaScript, actually, which is not that uncommon. Uh, okay, so I'll start you off this year with uh, Nathan Griffiths. I'm going to talk to you about charting without D3 using a library called Flot. Uh, we'll talk about other details and things later. Thank you so much. I got it. Just a quick little 10, minute, uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, so my name is Nathan Griffiths. I work for the Associated Press. I'm an interactive producer there. there. So we build um, whatever, interactives, uh, news apps, little graphics print for print and online, um, uh, sometimes for mobile as well. Um, so we do a lot of charting, obviously. Uh, one of the things that we have a fairly significant number of restrictions on um, what we can use uh, for the web, because we support, um, obviously we don't have like a client-facing website, we sell our content to other people who package it up and put it on the web, and God only knows how they're going to use it and what they're going to do with it. So we end up supporting things going back to as far as like IE7, uh, old versions of Firefox, these kind of things. So one of the major things, one of the major uh, hiccups we run into is <clears throat> trying to make things work. Uh, in older browsers, uh, charting, obviously everyone's favorite D3, and old versions of IE and whatnot. So uh, this is a library that I've kind of stumbled onto through a bit of trial and error. I found it to be very helpful. Not, not obviously as fantastic as G3, but it's not, uh, not a bad substitute if you're in a bind. Uh, this is Ole Larsen. He's the AOL, uh, it's the company works for. I think it's like a Danish uh, tech company. He kind of handles it and maintains it. This is, well, it's basically a, it's like a jQuery uh, plotting library. And the uh, focus, uh, you know, as they say here, it's like keeping it um, simple and attractive, and that actually is a pretty accurate um, description, really. And it's like one of the one of the strongest points of it. It's very simple to use, very fairly lightweight, um, and pretty attractive without like a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of defaults. Aren't always the best, but that's not too surprising. So, um, so I was just going to talk through like a bit of the pros of it, a bit of the cons, and I'll show you a couple quick demos that I've used this library with. Uh, just to give you a sense of what it can do, um, and then I'll be done and get out of here. Uh, so obviously the biggest thing, as I mentioned, is it works really, really well on versions of 
Uh, you, basically, anything that supports the Canvas element it works on. Uh, and it uses X Canvas for older browsers for IE7, IE6, all this kind of stuff. Um, and it loads up like on old, even on old browsers, loads up actually quite fast. Um, it's not uh, it's not super sluggish or painful to use. It's got some pretty active development. They just released uh, they had a whatever uh, early release or a, I don't know eight point two release I think that was uh, in end of November, and they're expecting another uh, the nine release is coming up. Um, there's a fair bit of traffic on its GitHub page and things like that, and on the uh, comment board, so you can get a bit of support if you need it. Uh, it's really flexible in terms of the options that you can use. It's uh, it's very clear to use. Like setting up your options is very easy. You can set like a, you know I set up a default template basically for this is what my basic chart is going to be, and for any custom chart, it's super easy to override that. Um, it's just like jQuery extend to kind of mush your two options objects together, and then you you're, you're on your way. So it's it's once you kind of do uh, I found that you, you do an initial setup for this, and then everything. Uh, Quite, quite quick, quite easy. Uh, it handles being responsive very well, which for us is big. Like we cover, in addition to all the old browsers, we cover like lots of different platforms, lots of different screens, as everyone uh, should be, I guess, doing anyways. So, and this this library handles. Um, it's very easy. There's a plugin to make it responsive. It's basically like three calls. You can wrap your own function and get three calls out of it. Uh, you can, excuse me, you can <coughs> make your own function with three calls and you've got a responsive chart, which is super nice. Uh, and obviously free. So if you're in the market for a free library that's got a fair bit of flexibility and uh, really old browser support, this is probably a good yeah. point. Uh, some of the cons for it is obviously dependencies. If you can't use jQuery for whatever reason, you're pretty much SOL. Uh, it draws to the canvas, so once they're drawn, you pretty much don't have, you don't have a tremendous amount of control over things that you've drawn once they're on. That is your can. lines, your charts. It's not like D3 where you just go in and pick one out and it works some magic on it. Once it's drawn, if you can't access it through through calls through plot itself, you're basically not going to be able to. Um, and all the fancy animations, or even not so fancy animations that you know, we're associating with most uh, online charts and, and graphics uh, these days, not really super well supported. There's some there's some kind of workarounds you can do with it, but it's not it's not the best. So if you need some animations, it's not a good not a good call. Uh, let me just go quickly. I'll take you to. Take a look at the, it's a. Oh no, internet! That's right. It's not. You guys are shit out of luck. You can have guests. Plotcharts.org. That's uh, that's the website. You can go look at it. They have a lot. So one of the things I find funny about this library is they, they you know they stress like oh it's a you want to make an attractive and, and easy to use library and focus on good looks and you look at all the examples and they all actually kind of look like crap. The examples are pretty pretty brutal. But you know, despite that, you can actually pull together some very nice charts. Uh, so I'll give you a quick, a quick look at some. All right, so here we go. <clears throat> I mean, super easy. You know, you got your few a few little lines there going for you. It's got some basic pop-up capabilities. Drawing like your, um, you know. Adding annotations and things like that, super easy. It can be basically any HTML, so you can, it's just like an HTML overlay. So you can do, there's a lot of flexibility, and this is kind of one of the, one of the strengths that I didn't focus on too much is um, pretty much you can pass anything a function. So any, any kind of formatting you need to do, anything you want to do with your, with your pop-up, anything you want to do with creating your overlays, your annotations, you can just like, you can create whatever you think you need to do. As long as you're, as long as it's returning a value, as long as your function is returning a value and passing it off to the options, you, it'll display it for you. And it does, it does all that quite well. It does our little, you know, our little uh, can find the corner of my screen. Oops, sorry. Oh, I can't. I was going to do the responsive demo, but I'm in full screen mode. I forgot. Um, and then the default chart itself just handles like your average like lines and bars and things like that. But there's a bunch of plugins that people have written for themselves. You can write your own plugins if you need to for making like little pie charts, pyramid charts, uh, slope graphs, I mean, you name it, like all the, all the kind of essentials. It's got all the essentials covered, and then there's plugins that cover like all the, all the basic versions of the more advanced charts, I suppose, you know? Um, <clears throat> tree maps, maybe not so much, but otherwise, uh, much of that kind of stuff is covered. <coughs> uh, so here's like, this is one of these, one, one project we did, we were just looking at the, um, 
doing a bunch of charts, kind of talking this sort of the budget through charts. So it's super easy to get your you know your bar charts with your uh, highs and lows here. Combine your charts together. Um, there's some more annotations. Like this. These are, those are again just like HTML that are tacked on. And once they're in there, and if you're if you need to make it responsive, you know <coughs> those there's not you don't have once you've got them placed, you don't have to do anything. Like that's all handled. So it, it really does a great job of clearing away a lot of the uh, a lot of the headache. And here's one we did. Oops. Here's one I did. It's again, it's a similar idea. Um, story through charts again. But here we can see one of the uh, some of the drawbacks uh, start to become a little bit more apparent. So I needed a little fancier pop up. I didn't want this thing following around. So it was actually like incredibly easy to just create a little function and a template, and boom, I've got this pop up that just sits up there in the corner. You know, again, that was super trivial to do. Uh, one of the kind of fa failings though, you know, so I've got these two charts. It'd be really nice if I got a nice little animation between these two. Just the charts just you know, a little up and down and you're done, but it doesn't support that. So you you end up with this, which is not the end of the world sure, but a little bit of animation here would be like kind of be that nice little bit of icing on the on the cake, right? So in, in that uh, in that kind of, that's where you start to run into a few, <coughs> few of the restrictions. But given that this, I can put, pull this up on IE7, I'm not recommending anyone do that just because. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to get burned if that actually does not, in fact, work quite like I planned. Uh, but again, that I've got, you know, we've got like, a, again, with simple annotations um, and whatnot. And it's, you know, this is, a, it's like super easy to just like load these into a page pretty much anywhere you want. Like these charts, I don't, obviously, we don't load them all at once. But but you can load up a chart or two charts on a page, and they load up very fast. Like there's not a lot of, we don't have a lot of lag time, there's not a lot of overhead going and putting all this stuff together. Um, so you can see you can make, you know, you're gonna go, if, if anyone's interested and you go and look at the website, you're gonna be like, wow, these, these demo charts that they use look terrible. So please remember that I, I did show you something. Don't look so, so horrible, yeah. Um, but I would, I would definitely recommend if you're, um, for whatever reason, needing to throw in some charts, <coughs> lightweight charts with broad browser, Broad-based browser support definitely you need to, to make it responsive with very little overhead. This is a very good kind of starting point. It's just a table right here. It's free. Who doesn't like free? Right? I think that's uh, probably not even my ten minutes, but I think that's where we're going to leave it here for now. Yeah. Thank you. Good. There is, in fact, a basketball court. Yeah, it's got a good. scoreboard. And, uh, Are you allowed to use it? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, I don't because I need to put my Which is embarrassing them. Right. <laughs> We're all too good. Right, obviously. That's why none of us play basketball. Exactly. Right. Uh, we have an uh, inter office team goes on this. Uh, very competitive. I've been <laughs> Oh, yeah, I missed it. Why are you using this over D3? Just because of the backwards Principally backwards compatibility, yeah. That's, I mean, that's the biggest one. I mean, there's other, there's other libraries that do it. Also free. It's principally backward compatible. Also free. Also responsive. Also easy to use. Well, yeah, that's actually, a, yeah, that, yeah, that's a very good point. There's like the building, the building of, building up a chart, like uh, the code for building a chart in plot versus D3, you know, for like a line chart like I was showing up there. I mean, there's no. Lots of charting library, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's handling a lot more here. Exactly. That's what yeah. Yeah. D3 can't SP. Is there D3 cannot pay the cap? That's good. 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 That's jQuery or anything? Oh, there's no part of jQuery. I haven't because we, um, all our projects, we basically have like a, we've got a wrapper application that uh, that contains like jQuery and, and underscore and a bunch of other libraries. So they're, they're already there. Whether we use them or not, they're getting loaded. So I don't have to, don't have to look at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to hear a talk about the jQuery wrapper. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Maybe get to do this earlier. Now I get to do the fancy speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to have uh, Matt Casey talk to you about Grunt, uh, better development with it, and all such other great things. Okay, who here uses Grunt or has heard of it? Or who, I guess who uses Grunt? Yeah. Okay, so some people haven't. That's good. If you haven't used Grunt, you need to start using Grunt. Basically, it just makes your life easier. It's like one of those things where like, oh, it sounds cool. I've heard about this, but I don't know if I need this thing. And as soon as you start using it, worlds open. Like you start learning new features. Just so many plugins. So we're gonna get into it. <coughs> oh, I don't like this. I can't see my other screen. Okay. Well, I had some notes that I can't see, so. No, no, take the two minutes. <laughs> From experience, like, take, take the two minutes instead of the okay. mm -hmm. Yes. How do I. <coughs> well, thank you. Well, I don't know, there is something. I think it's powerful. Oh yeah, if you're doing a sample display, you can grab both screens. Uh, yeah. So you just do this both screens. Yeah, if you want to do that. Another powerful one. Doing this, it was like, what presentation tool do you use? And there was like JavaScript ones that are cool, but those require the internet. So, stuck with Phil, standard. Okay, so Grunt is for anyone using JavaScript, HTML, CSS. You can use it for smaller, or large projects. Um, well known for being used in jQuery. You can actually build a smaller version of jQuery. Uh, it's sort of modular um, using Grunt. Um, if you need to install it, requirements are Node, NPM. And there's one little tricky part. This uh, package called grunt-cli for command line. So you install that globally. And that is a tool that then will find local Grunt installations. Because when you're working um, in a Node project, it's better to include your all your libraries locally in the package. Um, so you'll install Grunt locally in, in your new project, and you'll use Grunt CLI when you're writing your commands. Uh, this is what a really basic Grunt file looks like. This is all the configuration goes into. Uh, it starts out with your export function. Uh, and you have your project and task configuration, grunt init config. Uh, then you load your node modules, the plugins that you're going to use, and then you create these tasks. So default, if you just run grunt, it'll run the default task. And right, you can see the second argument is uglified, but you can include as many uh, grunt plugins as you'd like at that point. And it's, so you can actually create lots of tasks to do all kinds of things. Wait, if you just want to minify files in one task, if you want to concatenate, one step, or if you want to do those all at once, you can create a task to do that too. Um, so there's a ton of extensions. There's over 2,000. You go to gruntjs.com. Um, I say there's maybe about 10 or 15 that I actually use. Uh, if you look for the ones that start with grunt-contrib, grunt those are actually created by the people who wrote grunt, so those are going to be more reliable especially if you find two that are very similar. Um, and you could also use scaffolding tools like Gilman or Grunt init, which will actually do a little bit more work setting up Grunt for you. It'll create a Grunt file, it'll install some of these, uh, in the, it'll install the packages that you need to run the tasks. So some things that I use Grunt for, um, generating sprite sheets, that was a new world to me. You just have a folder of images and it generates a CSS file and a sprite. And you, so it gives you the classes based on the file names. Um, 
You can have it automatically lint, minify your files, run unit status and supports, pretty much all unit testing frameworks that run on Node. Um, there's one cool one that's, uh, if you've used Fabric with Python for a deployment, um, someone created that in Grunt. And it'll actually, you know, tarball your files and deploy them to the server and untar them on the server. Um, you know, you also have version control. And I'm not sure why you'd want to use that with Grunt. We, we use Git, but um, we don't use a Grunt task for that. I think um, it's useful if you're like a library author and you want to tag your releases or something. Yeah, you can see that. There's also one called bump. So if you do Grunt bump, it'll like update your version number each time. So it's, it just makes all these little things that are really annoying simple. It's just one simple like interface. Um, serving static files, if you want to work on a project and you just need a really simple static server, you can have it load your files and also watch for changes. So when you change your CSS or JavaScript, it'll actually reload your browser for you. Uh, live reload. Um, and that's what the, the watch plugin does. Um, so the two scaffolding things I mentioned, Grunt init and Yeoman. Grunt init actually used to be part of core Grunt. Now it's a separate module. It's, it's a little bit simpler than Yeoman. It basically gives you a prompt to set up your basic package configs, and it creates a Grunt file, and it, you can also set up like a folder structure that will be copied over. So you can get a Grunt init. Is there like five templates, they call them, that you can get online for jQuery, Angular, and some other popular uh, web app setups. But you can also create your own, They're very simple. It's just like a template JavaScript file and a, a folder um, with your scaffolding. Yeoman does all that, plus uh, it uses Bower to install like front-end dependencies. Um, and it has these things called generators, which are really cool. They're not just used for generating your first web app, but if you have, for instance, an Angular app, you can use generators to create services, factories. Um, so it's like Grunet on steroids, and I really suggest looking into it. Um, and it does a lot more work for you. So Grunet, like you would do Grunet package, but then you'd still have to npm install everything. Whereas Yeoman, you just do Yo Angular, and you have a Angular Angular app ready to go. Um, and that's really kind of all I had to talk about with Grunt. Um, a lot of it's more just getting used to it, deep diving, and finding what works for you. Anyone have any questions? Explore Gulp. Yeah, I'm just gonna ask that. What's that? <laughs> I have said you explore Gulp. No, I haven't. There might or might not be a talk next month. <laughs> uh, maybe to one of these. Do a comparison of Grunt and Gulp. I'm really curious if Gulp is actually faster than Grunt. It's like <coughs> plugins sure are faster to make. Well, so I heard that, that what it is. Oh, faster to make. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, there's no book. Yeah, yeah. You, just, you just wrap everything it's like a in a bench stream. stream. <laughs> Have you made a Grunt plugin? I haven't. A uh, Grunt one? Uh, I, so my first attempt was quite sour. I mean, they're basically grunt tasks, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's there's a lot of ceremony to understand the grunt API, whereas like, you know, there's a little bit of tasks. It's not that much ceremony. Yeah. It depends on how much you need. A grunt plug, quote unquote plugin, can be like a one liner that copies a file. There's limitation to go. It's really simple. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, w I would like to have more examples, but it's it's a lot easier to, to check out Yeoman and, and try it for yourself. So I, I saw some of the the um, plugins that you recommended, and uh, I've been using Grunt for a while since it was like three seven, and uh, I wanted to say I I really like uh, Notamon and uh, and Watch ran by Grunt Concurrent. I kind of feel like yeah. that's kind of like the best way to like run your development environment as far as debugging and just, just you know, if you don't have to refresh anything if you hook it up with uh, Mozilla's live reload. It's really nice. Yeah, that's kind of what the, uh, the Angular one does. So I actually, 
I installed the this I did a Yo Angular before this. It installed everything for me. And so basically it runs run server, it's running all the different tasks. It's loading the browser. You can't see it because it's on the screen. So this is what this is your app now. We're ready to go. It's got HTML, it's got Angular services. Look at the uh, code. You know, so all your code is in the app folder. View. So like he's saying now. If I change this, it's instantly like updated. That's awesome. <laughs> Like another thing, like, holy crap, now I'm saving like an hour of time every day just in like hitting refresh on my browser. It's a lot of good, less like thumb, thumb index finger work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I feel the pain. <laughs> um, and then uh, another trick is you do grunt dash help to see all the tasks that are available. So the Angular one, these are all custom tasks that come with the uh, Angular template. Can you control plus that if you want? What's that? I'll make that bigger. Command plus. <laughs> tasks at once. So like okay. if you want to do your JavaScript stuff and your CSS <coughs> stuff at the same time, there's no reason not to. It's just faster. Right, so you know like it has an auto prefix or you, it'll just auto prefix all your CSS. Like we don't use SAS, but we just would like some of the features. So you can sort of write your own grunt test to do those really basic CSS uh, optimizations. We have one more question. So I don't, I don't know if enough time is available, but um, you're mentioning grunt config. Um, let's say uh, you have two different uh, uh, directories that you're working on. Um, could you get it? Uh, could you have a single grunt task and just configure it to say uh, minify or uglify? Uh, you know, have it prompt you to config uh, which uh, directory you're working on. Um, actually, what you would do is you create. Uh, one task, and then inside of that configuration, you'd have uh, show you an example. So in the Yeoman one, you could have it watch. So for watch, it's watching. Coffee is one sort of location, and it has its own files. Mm -hmm. And then they maybe have a project called Coffee Test with its own files. So when you run it, you do grunt watch coffee or grunt watch copy test. Oh, it's cold. And you can create as many of these as you want. <coughs> and it would prompt you, uh, if, if you said grunt watch, it would prompt you to for a new configuration? No, if you do grunt watch, it would just run them all. Oh. Yeah, it's not very interactive. Yeah. So see, so see down here, like it concurrent, you, it's running, this is the uh, build step. So it'll actually create a whole folder based on your app folder. And it uses specific uh, tasks for the, that, this, that this folder. Or maybe you want to use the test version. OK, anybody else? Yep. Just another thing that's nice about Grunt inside of the config is you can actually write JavaScript functions that can build the actual config. So if you have another config, you can reference other properties and extend off them. Right. So it's not just a JSON file. It's actually a JavaScript file. Um, you can have, it's, it has a, a really basic templating system. You can see it's actually grabbing properties from the JSON. So yeoman.app, and then this is retrieved from either a JSON file or defaults to app. And then, but then that is inserted into your, your location in the kind of graph files. Line 11, super important grunt task. Or grunt plug. No. Oh, this one. Yeah, this, uh, this will actually, instead of 
uh, that example I showed you where you've got to load NPM tasks? <coughs> so right here, right? Grand Kajib Aglify. What he's saying that basically replaces that. So for Yeoman, they have so many different tasks and plugins, they'd have like 30 of those stupid dot load NPM task calls. But instead, this plugin, load grunt task, will just find them and, and load them all for you. So it's a lot cleaner. Honestly, it feels like the grunt people just didn't realize how their tool would be used. So they made you load it all manually, but now everybody does it automatically. Like, yeah, well, and that, when I started using grunt, I only use it for like a couple things. Minify. And then I checked out Yeoman, and it's like, holy crap, like, <laughs> you can do anything with it. Okay, so while Jen gets set up here and I walk over to get the water, I, uh, I will tell you so. <laughs> what are you all doing at? Going to BXL. You're honestly. going to BXL. I realized earlier when I talked about my birthday, I missed out an opportunity for you to all give me a birthday present, which is come and talk with me about JavaScript immediately after this meetup. We're going right across the street. Many of you have heard the speech already. I hope to see you all there. So this is Jen Shiver. She's going to be talking to you about Art Up with Markup, which is probably the closest talk we've ever had to the formal definition of the HTML5 app developer meetup. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Serious? No, sorry. Third most <laughs> 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 ah, damn it. This is the problem with having other speakers who are in the audience. That's the problem. Uh, oh, it is the hard. <clears throat> so anyway, thank you so much. Take it away. <laughs> I meant to do that in the beginning. He is the most fantastic karaoke like person ever. <laughs> Unbelievable. He knows the words like every song possible. They're on the screen. Doesn't even need to be screen at all. If he it is, was, like, if it is a 90s like <laughs> hit, yeah. chances are I do not need to scream. Just don't have to sing Waterfall. Oh, I'll sing that too. <laughs> I think we did sing. Was he not in the room for that? <laughs> you, we sang Waterfall. No, we did. No, it is. Uh, he just doesn't know the rap is a oh. problem. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, my talk is called Art Up with Marco. I'm going to be talking about code and art. So, my name is Jen Schiffer. You can um, find my stuff. My site is jen.ws, and I'm on Twitter a lot. It gets kind of weird there, but it's weird. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about code and art, which are two things that I'm super passionate about. Um, I grew up super into art and illustration and then sort of fell into code and I have a background in Java and PHP development. Whoa. And then <laughs> I sort of fell into front-end development not too long ago. Um, I'm the senior front-end uh, web developer at the MBA. Um, I work mostly on the MBA stats site and internal projects and international sort of stuff. Uh, got a pal who's at Lloyd's who I met at his party and he used to work on my team before I got there. So I didn't point. know I was bringing you two bringing together. together. <laughs> He's like, where do you work? Okay. Oh, so did I. <laughs> so, um, but outside of sports ball, and I can call it that. Now you're second, please. I told him to do this. Your fire command station. We have concluded our testing for today. <laughs> <laughs> for today. We've passed. Yeah. <laughs> Good going. So outside of um, basketball um, by day, I call myself an artist. Um, and I guess some people would say that that's pretentious which I don't necessarily think it is. Um, when you're being pretentious, you're putting on the air that you're more talented than you actually are. And anybody that knows me knows I'm super into like self-deprecating humor, and I will insult myself before anybody else has the chance to. So there are no airs being put on about here. So I wouldn't consult, consider myself pretentious, call myself an artist. But to put all of us on a level playing field for the rest of my talk, I'm going to call all of us artists. 
nobody's more talented than the person next to you. We're all artists, we're all good. Get rid of all that pretension. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So I gave my first conference talk back in, I guess it was June, at the jQuery conference in Portland. And then I spoke again at the jQuery conference in Austin back in September. And at both, I gave <coughs> talks, but both were along the lines of art and code. The Austin talk was a little more technical than the previous one. And it was very well received because there were a lot of different diverse people in terms of what they know um, in terms of jQuery and even programming in general, and a lot of educators as well. And one thing I think we all should be passionate about besides our jobs and ourselves learning is getting other people interested in our field. I used to be a college administrator at Montclair State University. I was the non-chair in charge of the comp sci department, and one of the things I did was recruiting and writing curriculum. And I know that in about five years, there's going to be over a million jobs in our field that will not be filled because not enough people are learning how to program or, or studying computer science. <coughs> so I found through my teaching at the grad school there and also doing workshops for young girls in my local area, which <coughs> is Montclair, New Jersey, um, that using art to teach code is very well received by those who are interested in learning and not necessarily, um, I guess, ready to jump right into it, or someone who wants to learn how to program, but they don't know where to start and what sort of problem to tackle. And so that's sort of how I fell into learning that. So we all know what code is. Most of us, if not all of us, are probably web developers, right? And how many artists are here? Everyone raise your goddamn hand. I just said you're all artists. <laughs> so one thing that I hate to do is define what art is. You really can't say what is art because we can debate that until our last breath. And I like to um, use my breaths to gasp for air between inhaling Oreos, not debating about <laughs> stupid stuff like that. But technically, if you type define art into Google, the definition of what art is, the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form, typically, not always, um, such as painting or sculpture, producing works, we appreciate primarily their beauty or emotional power. And the two most important words I find in that definition are expression and emotion. So typical mediums that we're used to, pencil, ink, paint, and so on. Um, and then there's more atypical mediums that I like to use for my art as well. I'll talk mostly about code. But the medium doesn't matter. It's how we're expressing ourselves and the emotions that we're expressing. So when did it become uncool to call ourselves artists? I don't want to make assumptions about all of you, but typically when I talk about being an artist or I talk to other people and ask them if they create art, a lot of them have said, no, I'm a computer scientist, or I'm a scientist, I'm not an artist. There's this weird <coughs> stigma attributed to art in the field. Um, I was talking this to my friend Joel the other day, and he was, this is something funny that he had said, and it's quite true. Um, maybe I am a little pretentious. Um, but are there any members of the Association of Computing Machinery in here, ACM? Okay. If you're studying computer science, or you're a computer scientist, or an educator, you should join the ACM. Um, in 1974, um, Donald Knuth, um, great living computer scientist, won the Turing Award. He also wrote the volume, The Art of Programming, which is also super interesting. Um, and in his speech from winning the Turing Award, he said that science is knowledge, which we understand so well that we can teach it to a computer. And if we don't fully understand something, it is an art to deal with. So in our industry, we are constantly learning. I don't think any of us in this room know everything we need to know to do our jobs and thrive in the industry. Um, things are constantly changing. Like Gulp. Who heard of Gulp a few weeks ago? <laughs> you know what I mean? So we are constantly learning ourselves new, item, new things, and we're using what we know to solve problems. So this makes us both, according to Dr. Knuth, artists and scientists. Does anybody recognize this painting? Blake. It's William Blake. Um, well, William Blake's the painter, and this is Newton. Um, this is one of my favorite paintings to talk about in terms of coded art. Um, in this painting, Newton is 
got his eye focused on, on the science, and he's got his back turned to all this beautiful color in nature. And that's how artists see people who work in our field. How many people have you told what you do when they said, oh, like, is it boring being in front of a computer all day? I hear that all the time. I used to hear that all the time. Um, 10 years ago, it was like a stigma to even get into computer science. What are you thinking? The dot com bubble burst, so forth. Um, so we don't want people to think that we have our back turn towards art and are focused solely on the science or just on our computer screen, because that's definitely not what we do. Programming itself isn't art, code is art. Um, and then at the same time, we don't want people to have their backs against science and focus just on art and beauty, because science is just as important, and some of us might think if not more, than the other side. So that's why it's important for us to think about art in terms of our programming and even outside of like what we do in work. So how do we do this? We can learn and we can teach with art and we can also express ourselves and create art using code. So how many people here heard of the Hour of Code? It was back in December. It's put on by CompSci Education Week um, where they wanted students um, to do code for one hour. And there are a lot of sites that had um, great tutorials for different languages to get students into learning code. And they had a lot of celebrities to join in. Um, and according to their site, they logged about 738 uh, million lines of code written by students. Um, Nas apparently wrote 15 lines of code. <laughs> I'm sure they're all nested for loops, so I'll give them a little bit more credit than that. Um, Ashton Kutcher said he wrote 99 lines of code, but I think he was using Node. Um, <laughs> my favorite tutorial for the hour of code is on processing.org. How many people here have heard of processing? Bye. Processing is great. It's built on Java. Um, you can make a lot of art with it, um, basically drawing with it, and those are um, processing applets which extend the Java applet library. Um, it's designed as a first programming language, so it's designed for teaching people how to program. I don't know what you guys learned when you went to school, if you went to school for programming. The first language I was introduced to in college was Java, uh, which in my opinion, and I, I can have an opinion because I was an administrator and wrote curriculum, um, it's probably not the best language to introduce people to programming. It's a little overwhelming. Um, so processing is really easy. Um, it sparked a kind of an art movement um, called generative art where you create algorithms um, that you can use multiple times and come up with unpredictable um, drawings. So creators.tv, I can open up here, okay, it's not on the internet. Um, I should be on the internet though. So if you go onto the processing site, they have a lot of great demos of art used um, through processing. Click on XM. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the alarm would have gone off again. Yeah, we're we're back. Back. The test is on. <laughs> You're on fire. Good job. So this is like a video. Um, and all the artwork inside of it is generated using processing. Um, and it's kind of cool and kind of spooky. And there's just tons of different um, projects out there that you can look at on the processing site. The Creators.tv is probably one of my favorites, and it attributes audio to it as well. Um, openprocessing.org is sort of this hub where people um, post the stuff that they made in processing. This is just this background here. It's just a collection of like some of the latest ones posted. And as you can tell, a lot of these are probably from tutorials that people were making because of all the Google <coughs> logos. Uh, but you can check it out there and find other cool stuff along with the source code. And the syntax is super easy. And if any of you guys have drawn with JavaScript on HTML5 Canvas, you will recognize these functions. Um, so in order to generate this sort of alpha channel uh, ellipses here, you just set the size the background of the page, um, the fill color, and then you draw the lips. And here you're drawing three lipses of different colors. 
So it's super easy and you generate art. And if you have a student, no matter what age, and you want them to learn how to, or just write a couple of lines of code, um, there's one, two, there's eight lines of code here and they generate an image. And when you create art, you're more likely to have a wider audience that appreciates what you do. Now when I'm at work, and I'm, I work mostly a lot with um, the tables on our stat site and visualizations, my audience doesn't go out further more than like basketball fans, other web developers, and like my dad. So if you're creating like a drawing, you have a much wider audience, people who could appreciate art, as opposed to another problem you might uh, be solving. So another reason why I'm super into code and art is because I'm a JavaScript developer <coughs> today because of art. Um, and I got into learning JavaScript more and using it more, especially the jQuery library, because I wanted to create art. <laughs> I'm super into 8-bit art. And um, this is something I draw. That's Grimace. When I grew up, I liked to draw cartoons. Love to draw cartoons. Um, my favorite cartoons. I probably drew Garfield on like the walls of my bedroom like a million times. Um, Magellan from Eureka's <coughs> Castle, which is a Nickelodeon show I'm super into. Um, and Batley as well. Uh, but uh, so I love making 8-bit art and pixel art. And uh, I didn't, I couldn't really find many tools out there that had like the proper grids and like Photoshop was a little bit difficult to get the pixels just right. Um, so my problem was I have, I have this medium that I want to use, but like I don't have the tools to help me create the art that I want to. And so I decided that I want to build something. And so I did and that's make8bitart.com. So I launched this version a couple of months ago, and what it is, it's an in-browser HTML5 canvas that allows you to draw 8-bit art. Um, the initial color palette is 8-bit friendly. Um, it follows a color palette of one of the older Microsoft 16-bit um, computers, but it came with two chips and one um, had the 8-bit palette. Um, if you're an 8-bit truther, just like back off. I don't want to. I don't hear. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> argued so many times on the internet, like why even bother? Um, but it allowed me to draw my cartoons. I like, like Kermit or Bee and Puppy Cat. Anybody know Bee and Puppy Cat? <laughs> um, and then like draw my own characters, like this little crocodile here, which underneath says "Hey, hot stuff." Um, <laughs> it's learning via pixels. What up? Um, and so this is the application live right here. I have these like toolboxes that you can sort of move around. Um, right now there's, well this is my analytics, there's five people on here um, today. Um, and it's in active development and it's open source on GitHub. Jen Schiffer is my username. Um, but you can uh, change your pixel size. Um, there's one canvas for actually drawing on it. And you can save the full page canvas onto your machine. Um, and then I also use two canvases to create a selection save so that you can click and drag. It creates this like, it erases that section of the canvas with the new one and then saves it, um, opens it up as a PNG file um, of data in the new tab. So there's a lot of um, canvas going on here because it works in the browser. Um, also it uses local storage. so. If you HTML5 local storage, so if you're on like a new browser and this works for you, if you accidentally refresh the page, which I do all the time, you don't lose your drawing. Um, I had to get that in there because that was really annoying me. And you can sort of like hide the tools and stuff like that. And all the code is open source. And I also created a couple of plugins for it. Um, and like your code again could be art. Um, if you look at the HTML document, and this is all. Um, it used to have PHP in it, but I removed it because I had artists who wanted to work on it locally on their machine if they were like flying, and so I made it so all you have to do is download it, just open up index file in your browser, and you're ready to start drawing. Um, but you know, code can be art too, whether it's ASCII art or not. I really like dinosaurs. Um, and it involves math. Ooh. Um, I really love math as well. 
And so this is just some of the source code that shows that in programming, you might have to run into some math a bit. So the draw pixel function takes in the position that you click. And depending on where you click, I have a, a grid set up based on the pixel size of where that square is going to be drawn. And so you don't have those pixels overlapping with each other. Um, and so I find myself more and more having to break back into algebra. And also, as I'm working on a fill algorithm, which I'll get into, um, a little bit of linear algebra as well. So my computer science graduate studies have helped me out with this, but it's not so hard that anybody that's sort of trying to create the same thing can't sort of look up or ask somebody to help out with or collaborate. Um, the two <coughs> plugins that I use for it, um, I created their jQuery plugins, uh, Pixeled in Draggy Bits. Um, we'll probably post somewhere in the links to our slides and you can find all the stuff there. Um, the Draggy Bits is used to have the toolboxes move around um, so that they're not in the way if you want to draw because the initial version of this wasn't full page and that, that was sort of constraining for the artists. And then um, Pixel Div is um, a plugin that takes an image and automatically pixelates it by converting each pixel on that image into a div box that you can set the size of. So this color palette here, this is 8-bit colors, um, is actually a, um, I believe it's a 16 by 16 pixel image that is then blown up and these are each div boxes so that you can hover over and pick what color you want to draw with. And again, there's also math involved in converting the RGB into hex and the other way around so that other people can choose depending on what their choice of adding colors is. So it was a learning process for me, but I also wanted to post it so that other people can use those same tools and also learn. And I have sort of like an apprentice college student who has been learning how to um, program in JavaScript by studying Make 8 Bit Art. And hopefully she'll be doing her first pull request ever uh, on it in the next couple of weeks. When you create alt art, again, you have a larger audience. Um, I was fortunate that an older version of 8-Bit Art was on display at the Ontario Science Center for their Game On 2.0 exhibit last year. And so there were a lot of people who were making 8-Bit versions of themselves at this Science Center, which is really awesome and fun, and is giving me opportunities to create art for art museums, because art museums are now getting more and more into digital art besides just video glitch and stuff like that, which is also super cool. So if you make something cool with code, it, it doesn't have to just stay on the web for yourself. There are people that are interested in galleries to put that stuff there, which is also really neat. When you're also making art, you can use it as inspiration for your projects. Um, one of the projects, I built an internal <coughs> chat client um, using WebSockets for the MBA and using make 8-bit uh, art, I created something called Pixel Chat, which is sort of like, has anybody here had a DS and used Picto Chat? You used to draw your messages to people and go up. Um, I wanted to make a web version of that, and that's Pixel Chat. And so you have your canvas, and you pick your colors, and then you send your message up here, and you can talk to people. There's not a live version of it yet, because I have to add some security reasons. People are embedded, embedding very bad images. And stuff. <laughs> took, took like 30 seconds. I know exactly who did it too, but. <laughs> so, but you, you always have that one friend that's just looking to just like show that you don't know like exactly what you're doing. Like, friend. Uh, <laughs> so what did I learn from doing all this, besides how powerful jQuery is and how much I actually love JavaScript, I learned a lot about HTML5, um, Canvas, and local storage. The beauty of working in a browser, it's so much more portable. Again, I have people who have said that they've downloaded it onto their machines and have flown, and also it works with touch on like iPads um, and, and tablet devices. It works on your phone, but it's so tiny, it's, you're better off with like an iPad. But they've used it on their iPad on a plane without internet so they can draw and have something to do. And they have their kids use it, and it's just super cool. It also tells me the hell of working in a browser. Um, again, I come from back-end development, and like with PHP, some of these things are so much faster to do. Um, 
like I'm working on a fill algorithm to paint an area within like if I do a circle of paint inside. It sounds simple, but it involves recursion. And one thing that these browsers keep throwing at me when I'm trying to paint a large area is too many, con too many recursions. Um, so I have that constraint that I'm trying to um, improve the order of the algorithm so that it's faster and doesn't sort of <coughs> cut out halfway through. Um, it taught me that I wasn't crazy for minor in math because I use it an awful lot, um, even though I didn't anticipate that. And also that I still love art, even as a developer. And also from learning HTML5 um, elements, um, I was able to take that to my job. I'm very fortunate that the MBA is very forward thinking when it comes to technologies on the web. Um, I, I am biased, but I would say that we're much better at it than any of the other sports. Um, we have a lot of these tables. They're kind of ugly, but there's a lot of information, and I love statistics. Um, and I had said, well, we have all these tables. We have editorial people and like different publishing companies that don't have their own teams like the New York Times does to create really nice tables. And they just do a screen cap, and they usually miss a lot of stuff. Um, so I was like, well, why don't we allow them to generate an image of a table? And so by drawing all the elements onto a canvas, you can now click generate image, and it gives you a PNG file with the time and all that sort of stuff and our ugly watermark there. Um, and when we launched a big project, um, videos for each of our staffs, which of those links are on the table there, um, we found that like the Daily News, um, USA Today, were generating these images. It was much easier for them to do that. And we kept our branding on it as well, which is really important to entertainment companies. So. I never would have thought of that if I wasn't immersed in Canvas for this passion project, making good art of mine. So there's a practical use to creating <coughs> art. You explore things and you think, oh, I can work on this in my job or in something that's maybe not as artsy. Um, we have a lot of visualizations. Um, we use Grunt and we're using Flop for a couple of upcoming visualizations that we're posting because we do have a large audience, specifically in China, who still uses Internet Explorer 6 um, and 7. And so um, that's something that we just have to eat up and, and deal with. And so we now we have shot charts using SVG that are drawn. And we, can, we have a middle tier that converts it to a PNG file so that editorial people can take them and put them in articles and stuff like that. But we are exploring visualizations using HTML5 um, to get into that. Um, but not all of your art has to be visual. Um, so I like to write satire. Um, it's got me in a lot of trouble this week. But um, there's different ways of expressing art besides just visual stuff. I'm going to go through a couple of projects, art projects that I've done and my friends have done. Um, this one, Pick Selfies, is one of my own, um, and you can randomly generate um, selfies that have been sent to me, and I use PHP to generate um, each pixel of an image into a div box, and there's the color picker as well that you can see. Um, I created this the same day that um, Gawker and Jezebel posted an article that was all anti-selfies, and since I'm kind of a troll and like to push buttons, um, I decided to make something like that. Um, so it's more pixels that I'm into. Um, it's the PHP version of what my Pixel did, jQuery plugin does, but it's much faster because it's server side, um, which shows that PHP is better than JavaScript. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's open source, um, and if you want to be added to the group, then send me your selfies. This is something that my friend Brian Arn um, had made. He's another uh, JavaScript developer. And he um, created this. He said this was years ago. And he showed this off at the jQuery conference in Austin, um, where you can draw stars onto a canvas. And it's really pretty. And then you can start animation, drawing. And just something to play around with to show how easy it is to animate and draw onto a canvas, not even flash, and so forth. Um, another thing that he sent me as a joke, which I really loved, um, this is uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I love Comic Sans, and if you have a problem with that, again, don't bring it up with me. Uh, <laughs> life's too short to be complaining about type, in my opinion. Um, but that's just something cool and fun and nicely did. My, my friend Joel made this cool kaleidoscope app where you can input your own images. Um, he really likes butterflies, so initially there's a, butterfly, a bunch of butterflies in it. Um, and so these are just people who don't, who don't really consider themselves artists. They're great developers, um, but they, they are artists. Um, my friend Jim Doran, he works at, um, where is it that he works? John Hopkins, he works in the pancreatic cancer um, section. He's a software engineer there. And he also teaches development, and he's a fantastic artist. And so this is like a flash video that he made of his own drawing. He loves like skeletons and skulls and Day of the Dead stuff, which is mm -hmm. really fantastic. Um, you can go to jimdoran.net and see all of his stuff. So that's like stuff that he's done. <laughs> with he's brilliant. Um, he actually ended up um, making a lot of dioramas with Altoid tins that are really tiny, and Altoids contacted him and commissioned. They sent him vintage tins, and they sold the, his art on eBay for charity. Um, and then he ended up having his stuff in the Baltimore Visionary Arts Museum, um, which was like his dream to, to be in, and it happened within months just from putting out art and using his tech savvy to create a website that puts it out. Um, this is some non-code art of his. He makes really great dioramas and spoons now that are fantastic. Um, this is my cat, Jeffrey. He made, he made one for me. Um, so he's really, some cool stuff, not, e not even involving code. And if you're not into making visual art, you can express your emotions through different ways, like communication, teaching, speaking to groups about anything, any performance art, um, and even mentoring, getting other people interested into it if you're not ready to broadcast your own stuff. And then there are non-developer activities, which I think are really important. Sometimes I find myself with like in two weeks realizing I haven't talked to anybody outside of my office, and we're like a small team of five people. Um, and I haven't done anything but like look at statistics and sort columns and like work on jQuery, which I love jQuery, but oh my gosh, after a couple of days, it's like kill me. Um, so thinking of hobbies, whether it's art or anything like that, making music, doing karaoke with John P. Paul, um, <laughs> exploration of fields and interaction with non-developers, which I love my developer friends, you guys are all fantastic, but sometimes you don't want to talk about code or you just want to see what other people have been up to in their own jobs and their own lives you might be interested in. One of my dear friends, she's a book designer at Work in Publishing and just hearing about the design process and even the development process <coughs> in publishing companies is super fascinating to me. So really what I want you to take away and if you haven't before, is give art a chance, be stigmatized, being called an artist, because we're all artists, and even when you leave tonight, you're still artists, you're stuck with that forever, whether you like it or not. Um, I want you to get people interested in programming, and through art, it's super easy to do that. Um, make art with code for universal appreciation, so that you're making some, make something that you're passionate about, that other people who are non-technical can be passionate about. And don't be tied to your machine, because you're going to get stuck in that rut, and you don't want your back turned to beauty, um, and have other people who are facing the other way thinking that you're all about just the screen. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I really want a beer, so <laughs> why don't we like find me at the bar <laughs> and you can ask me that, okay? Cool. Okay, So, you're gonna have to give me a second up here. So I'm gonna <laughs> Uh, I think I'll run over there. You're going to sing? So, no. I'll sing later. Um, so thank you, Jen, uh, if you haven't. Um, all right, so she